We're going to start in alphabetical order with the candidates opening two minute statements. So Joe Leacona <laughs> is first up. Well, um, as, you, as you said, my name's Joe. Um, I live, been in the, I've been in the ward about 11 years. I have a bachelor's degree in philosophy. I have a master's degree in business administration. I'm recently retired from 22 years of teaching at Columbia College Chicago, uh, where I uh, taught computer science. Um, I'm a gardener. I'm a father of two daughters. I have two sons-in-law and four grandchildren. Let's see. I'm running because I think that Chicago politics should be about citizens, not corporations. And when I think of the things coming out of City Hall, how they affect us, both positively and negatively, um, I want to make sure that it's always a positive spin for all of us. Um, and, and I think citizens must come first. Um, I'm not long on speeches and lots of uh, um, verbiage, uh, so I'll cut it short there. Um, I have a website. I have literature. Uh, please pick it up uh, and feel free to contact me anytime you want, and we'll talk. Um, we the candidates, we've been spending a lot of time together today, so I'm looking for, <laughs> forward uh, to this evening. So once again, I'm Marge Lorino, and I'm uh, honored to be your alderman, and I'm honored to be here tonight. Certainly thank you to uh, the sponsors of this event. Um, I want to thank you for putting this together. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about why I'm running. I'm running because I love this community. Um, I think this is an important opportunity for us tonight to talk about the issues facing our community. And I believe by working together, we can get things done. And tonight's forum is part of that ongoing process. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bob and Joe for being here and being part of the conversation, certainly. So a little about me. I was uh, born and raised here in the neighborhood. Uh, I went to school in the 39th Ward, and I raised my family here. So I think that um, I have a very good understanding of the kind of things that are important to you. Good schools, safe streets, efficient city services. But I think there's more to talk to about tonight, so I'll just say that uh, some of my priorities, and I know that you, you've heard this before, public safety. Certainly education is a huge uh, issue here in our neighborhood, um, and infrastructure. So I'm looking forward to having those conversations this evening, uh, and I look forward to your questions. Well, Mr. Murphy. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. It's great to have an opportunity to speak to you all and tell you why I'm running and what I believe the issues of the award are. Um, I wanted to thank very much uh, the North Mayfair Improvement Association, uh, Albany Park Neighbors, um, the Hollywood North Park Community Association, and Old Irving Park for hosting this event. I think this is a great thing, and communities coming together is part of one of the things that I'm really about. Um, so again, my name is Robert Murphy. I am a husband, a father, an architect, and a community leader. I am running to build a better ward. Um, I've worked on economic development and community building. I'm a problem solver and have been a leader in my community because I'm willing to take on difficult issues, and I'm willing to, and eager to engage the community in how decisions are made. Um, among my uh, accomplishments, I've been president of my community association in Forest Glen for three years. I've been a leader and a founding member in the FAIR Coalition regarding the airplane noise that's been put over your heads. Um, I was one of the founding members of the Jefferson Park Sunday Market, a market that we got up and running in about six weeks. And I'm a licensed architect in Illinois for over the past 20 years, and I've worked on many complex projects, including infrastructure projects, where budget is always the primary concern. So I'm running because the 39th Ward, in the 39th Ward, development has been flat, and I'm going to fix that. Because the Ward office has been unresponsive, because I believe 50 years of one family is too much, and I will change that. Because the current alderman has been a rubber stamp for 20 years, and that has not served you well. The police department has been allowed to wither, and this is unacceptable. I will be your voice in city council. I'm going to be your service alderman. 
sorry, I saw the time and it threw me off. <laughs> I will involve you and the community in how decisions are made in the office, and I will fight for the value of your tax dollar to make sure to maintain your police and your city services. Thank you all. Um, so our first two questions are on the topics of safety and quality of life. And Margaret, you'll be the first one to answer the first question. So safety has different meanings in the different communities throughout the ward. Um, for some folks, it relates to gun and gang violence. For others, it's more about pedestrian or cycling safety. And for still others, perhaps chronic speeding and how that impacts the life of the residents. So the question is, how will you work with community groups, CAPS, and other city officials to address safety in the ward? I think safety, as I said earlier, is one of the biggest issues um, uh, that, that come across our mind when we think about community. Um, and I want to say that uh, living in representing this community, I know that we all watch out for one another. I think we have a neighborhood that um, attends their CAPS meetings. Um, I personally um, actually uh, send either go to a CAPS meeting myself or send a a representative from my staff to each and every CAPS meeting uh, in, in the ward. Um, and we get our uh, issues, we hear things there that we think are important, we bring back and develop those. I also try to do my best to make sure that I have good relationships with the commanders. I talk to them on a regular basis. Commander Bay is new to me because of the redistricting, uh, but I've always had very long and good relationships with the commanders here in 17. Uh, just recently, we were able to um, uh, award some of our officers for a fine job uh, that they did in a home uh, up at 4200 West Rosemont, where squatters had come in and taken over a, uh, a home that was uh, vacant but uh, for sale. It was, a, it was a lovely home. They knocked down the for sale sign. They moved right in. We worked with the neighbors, and we worked with the police. Uh, to make sure that we move them out uh, in a, a very timely manner. It was a very frightening situation, uh, but we were able to uh, do that. Um, we also have had a reduction in crime uh, here in 17, and once again, I think people move to this neighborhood because it is so safe. Um, we work with people on safety issues that have to do with um, uh, traffic safety, um, and I think that we we do a fine job of bringing the community in and letting them uh, address those issues and go forward. Thank you, Margaret. So, uh, Robert, you are the next. Uh, next. <coughs> Again, the question is regarding safety. You want to put this behind you? No, it's good. Okay. Well, as long as it's not in the middle of what I'm saying. Um, I think the, the, the core of a community is how safe it is. And it's, I think it's because of all the work and the pride that you have all brought to the, to the Northwest side, to the 39th Ward, is the reason why this is such a safe community. I think you deserve all the credit for why this is a uh, desirable place to live. I think we've got great police officers, both in 17 and in 16. But unfortunately, the police force has really been allowed to wither over the last few years. We've lost a lot of police officers every year to attrition, and we haven't gained those officers back. I'm advocating for a thousand new police officers. This is something that Ram talked about, promised when 2011 when he ran. I think it was a good idea then. I think it's very necessary now. We're losing about 400 to 500 police officers every year to retirement. We have to make that up because you are being punished for being a safe part of town by having your police and your TAC teams taken to other parts of town. I think you've gotten to a level below the level of a real safe community policing. We need to have more police. We need to have more presence to help you who have already made this area so safe. Um, and I wanted to also say that we, you need to have an alderman that's gonna advocate for this. So when the mayor came out with the last budget and there was no money for police in it, you need to have an alderman that's gonna say, no, this is not acceptable. Not an alderman who's gonna say they're happy with that budget. You need somebody who's gonna be fighting for you and I'm gonna be that alderman. Um, I, th I think Robert has hit the problem, uh, the nail right on the head, um, although I think we need to have uh, um, 2,000 more policemen, not 1,000. 
Um, I think if you look at the numbers, you'll find that, that our numbers of policemen are drastically lower than they should be. Um, and I think a good police force is necessary for a safe citizenry. I also go back to a time when I was a child, uh, which is probably longer than most of you go back, um, when policemen were more available. Um, I'd like to see, especially in nice weather, I'd like to see policemen walking beats, uh, stopping in at stores and such like that, so we know who our policemen are and they know who we are. That makes a safer, more secure neighborhood. It's an old-fashioned practice, but sometimes I tend to be an old-fashioned kind of guy. Um, the other part of safety has to do with taking care of those who need to be taken care of. And I'm very dismayed that, uh, that Emmanuel uh, saw fit to close the, uh, the mental health clinics that were in our neighborhoods. And these need to be opened again. So, that, so the people who live in this neighborhood have good care um, for their psychological and societal needs. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with being safe. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so the second question uh, goes more toward quality of life. The city of Chicago has introduced and expanded active transportation programs, such as dedicated and protected bike lanes, divvy stations, and road diets. Other wards have developed transit advisory councils or transportation action committees to gain insight into the needs and safety that folks have um, regarding enhanced pedestrian and cycling accessibility and safety in the 39th Ward. Uh, do you support the creation of such a 39th Ward Transit Advisory Council and, and how will you enhance pedestrian and cycling accessibility and safety? Okay. So, uh, Robert, you're first up. And if, you and if you could please hold the microphone a little closer, I guess folks are having a hard time hearing you. Sorry. <clears throat> Not used to a mic, more used to yelling in the room. Um, yes, I would definitely support uh, a transit advisory council. I think the issues with bike safety and pedestrian safety are very, very important in the city for our side streets, for our main streets. It's very important going into the 21st century that we have more ability to accommodate bikes safely, um, that families who are riding their bikes are safe on our streets. Um, I think that, you know, partnering with groups like Active Transportation, who are a big advocate for cycling in the city is also an important thing. There's a lot of uh, expertise and knowledge there that can be utilized in the city for pushing this forward. Um, and then just as far as the city has been working to expand divvy stations throughout the city as well as expand bike paths, and I'm also for that, so long as there's a way that we can make, sh make sure that it works well within the streets that we already have. I'm, I'm uh, certainly in favor of, of bicycling. Um, I'm an American boy, so of course we ride bikes. Uh, but I, I think that part of the transportation problem needs to have forethought and fore planning. And as your alderman, one of the things I'm going to make a lot of noise about is future transportation in Chicago. I think we look at electric trains, we look at people mover kinds of things, we need to find a way to uh, downplay our reliance on uh, uh, automobiles and find other ways that are more efficient, more safe, and less polluting to move citizens around around the city. I think we, that's a long range plan, nothing can be done in a few weeks, but we need to begin looking at these kind of things. Just like our ancestors 100 years ago had the foresight to build the subway system and the L stations that we have now, we need to do the same thing for the next 100 years worth of transportation. And by sitting around wondering about it, it's not gonna happen. We need to have aldermen who will plan for it in a good way, and that's what I'm advocating. Um, I think the concept of a transit advisory council is a, a very good one. Up until this point, I, 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 I bounce a lot of my ideas off of my local chambers, off of our uh, community organizations, and on the point of bicycles, I use Bob Costigar quite a bit, all right? So um, I want to talk a little bit about what we currently have in the 39th Ward. Uh, we have a number of rail-to-trail projects, uh, the first one being uh, 
the Saugenash Trail, which was very successful. Actually, when we first initiated it, it was one of the most contentious meetings that I remember being at in, in my career. But it's turned out to be just a wonderful, wonderful asset here uh, in the 39th Ward. Um, so as a result of that, uh, the community certainly did want to see more of that kind of thing happening. Um, so now we're currently developing the Weber Spur. Uh, I think that that's going to be, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a time coming, but I think that we're working with people uh, to make sure that it's moving in uh, as fast of a, a matter as it can. We're also currently dealing with some issues, but I know that this is also going to be a wonderful asset to our community, uh, the North Branch Trail. We also have Elston Avenue, which is a um, a, uh, a bicycle it has a bicycle lane, and we're always looking to improve safety there. Um, so I think that maybe a transit advisory council might be able to advise me on that. But the police are very good, uh, and the Chicago Department of Transportation has helped us uh, put together some uh, pedestrian safety uh, plans that I think are certainly worthwhile, and the community has been uh, behind them 100 percent. Thank you. So our next uh, couple of questions are going to address issues related to ward services. And this first question, which uh, Joe, you get to answer first, has a lot of parts to it. So maybe we'll give you an uh, extra few seconds to answer this one. Um, as aldermen, in terms of providing ward services, what would be your priorities and would you consider um, participatory budgeting and how you would monitor the use of TIP funds? Um, I certainly uh, am a full supporter of uh, participatory budgeting. I'm also a full supporter of having um, meetings with citizens in the evening in the ward, across the ward, so it's more convenient for you to come someplace closer to, to actually meet and talk and share with us. Uh, we will do that on a regular basis um, uh, once I'm elected. The, would you repeat some of the other parts of that question? I know. I'm afraid of splitting it up too much and then I'll lose my order here, but um, so, how would you um, look at budgeting or dispersing menu money and TIF money? Okay, All right. um, so I think that an alderman needs to have advisory councils who work with him in order to advise him that is composed of representatives from throughout the community. So I, I would actually have a TIF commission in my ward uh, made up of businessmen, um, and citizens, educators, you name, whatever it takes, um, so that we can look at TIF money and, uh, and spend it wisely. I'm also opposed to the movement of TIF money from one TIF district to the next one. Uh, I see no reason for our money to go to our neighbor. That might be okay, but then it goes to his neighbor and his neighbor. And if you look at the progression and the movement of TIF money, it all ends up in the loop, and, and I'm opposed to that. I think the TIF money should stay where it's generated to make businesses and neighborhoods thrive here, and I intend to see that happens. Thank you. So, Margaret, yes, you're next. Do you need me to kind of refresh or repeat? No, no I think I, I made some notes when you repeated it the second time, so thank you, Patty. Um, I think that uh, the uh, participatory budget uh, concept is a good one. However, I think I actually do that now. Um, I think I work with the local communities uh, to identify the kinds of things that are needed out in our neighborhoods. Uh, geographically, I have a, mu a much larger ward currently than, say, the lakefront, uh, where those that type of budgeting might be more appropriate. But uh, the way we uh, actually get uh, information on how to use our menu money uh, has to do sometimes with circumstances. For example, last year, because of the horrendous winter that we had, we spent 95% of our money on um, actual street resurfacing. Um, but I, I think that's something that the neighborhood actually called for and insisted on at the time. 
Um, but I think that there's always more opportunity. I send my staff out to survey the neighborhoods. I take requests through uh, our newsletters. We get requests from our, uh, uh, as a result of our email blasts. So I think there's a variety of ways that we actually uh, ascertain um, how we are going to spend our money. Um, so I just, uh, let me move on to the TIF for a moment. Um, TIFs have been very successful here in the 39th Ward. We have used them for many a capital project. Uh, brand new Albany Park Library, a, two new, actually one new school, uh, and we have two new schools. One was used, uh, built with TIF funds. Um, we also uh, have built additions uh, with TIF funding uh, in addition to using it for uh, economic development. Uh, specifically, I'll just mention the CCH uh, building at Peterson and Pulaski. It's called Walter Kluwer's right now. Um, so I think that uh, I've worked very closely with the community in order to bring these uh, TIF dollars to where they needed to be. So um, I, participate, I participated in participatory budgeting when uh, Forest Glen had been in the 45th Ward, so I understand how it works. One of the tenets of my campaign is to bring participatory budgeting to this ward because I believe that you as voters, you as taxpayers, deserved and should have a say on how that ward money is spent. Now you can decide that you want to spend it all for resurfacing and for filling potholes, or you can say we have other projects that we'd like to do, school stuff, buy more trees to replace all the trees that we've been losing. Whatever it is, there are a lot of great ideas that can come out of these things that can allow you to have you know, more effect on how money is spent and understand better also about what it costs to do various things as far as how much it costs to actually fix a street. This is a very important thing that I believe that people need to be involved in. Um, as far as the community saying, you know, to the alderman how the money should be used, as president of the Forest Glen Community Association, I was never approached about what my thoughts were on that, and I've never talked to any other president in any of the other communities in this ward who were actually asked that question. So there's no back and forth communication here about how the money is currently spent, and that's something that I'm gonna change. As far as TIFs goes, um, it's this pretty much the same thing, but I want to tell you that one of the first things that I want to do with the TIFs that we have here is to do a worldwide audit to understand how this money has been spent, where it's been spent, what's still in the TIF, understand what the TIF can still do, has it accomplished its goal, has it done something totally different. There's been no real transparency with the TIFs in our board or pretty much the whole city. As Joe was saying, a lot of this money gets, we don't even know where it goes. A million and a half dollars sent over to Thai Town, and it's still not open after all these years. Half of that money already spent. These are the kind of things that I would involve community in, how your money is spent. Chambers, local businesses, community groups. What do we want to use our TIF districts to do? Thanks, Robert. Can, this is going to be part two of a sort of a, a ward service question, so if we can bring the mic back to Joe, I'll just go in the same order here. So given that there are a number of residents uh, in the ward, business owners who speak languages other than English, how will you accommodate them and what tools do you plan to use to communicate both with the folks who don't speak English and also ward wide? I, I wish you'd been to my home about an hour ago when I printed out a copy of my door hanger in Korean. Uh, that's how I'm going to do it. Um, I'm going to, I have to hire someone to translate Korean because I don't speak it at all. Um, but uh, in my, in my, I do promise um, in my uh, ward office, I will have both a, a Spanish speaking person, bilingual of course, and a Polish speaking person. Um, and I will have, uh, I will know other people who can speak the other languages for me as well. Um, I think that just like my material is bilingual, I think that a lot of my ward publications have to be bilingual as well. That just faces the reality. As a matter of fact, though, it's a bigger reality than we think. I'm not sure the number is correct, but I've heard that 35 different languages are spoken in our high school by the students. Uh, it's a challenge, but you know what? 
as a, as a grandchild of immigrants who came here speaking Sicilian, I can tell you that this melting pot is the most successful country in the world because it's so diverse with so many talents from so many nations, and I love it that way. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. Um, let me just say that uh, uh, it's a challenge. We have a wonderfully diverse community here in the 39th Ward, and um, Joe says that we have 35 languages. I've heard that number go up to 50 languages, and sometimes it, it changes from, from, from week to week. But nonetheless, um, that's what makes our community so rich. Um, on my part, I like to say that within my office, um, I have uh, fluent speakers in Korean, uh, Spanish, and Russian. And should there be other languages that need to be addressed, we will find a way to make sure that happens. But we're so delighted, once again, that we live in such a, a diverse community uh, that we, we have these issues. Uh, they may be bumps in the road, but we'll certainly do our very best uh, to communicate with each and every one of the people that, rep that I represent in the 39th Ward. Thank you. There you go. Thanks. One of the big things that I'm gonna do as your alderman is that I'm gonna have an open and accessible office. I'm gonna have ward night where you can come and see me and get an appointment and sit down and talk to me one night a week. It's gonna be an open office. We're gonna really raise the level of communication both with individual uh, residents of the ward, with community groups through letting people, giving people heads up when development or other things are coming. We're gonna have communication both through email and through social media. How I'm running my campaign right now is how I'm going to run the ward. And what I'm doing right now is that I'm going out to businesses, I'm promoting them when I go eat out, I'm finding out what the business owner's concerns are. One of the ways that I'm going to raise the level of how we have business services in this ward is that we're going to go and we're going to talk to the businesses before projects come fall on their heads, as it were. So when there's a big infrastructure project like's happening on Bryn Mawr over the last seven months or whatever it is, they're not going to find out about it because there's a sign posted on the sign on the light pole, but I'm going to come to them two months or however many months we can in advance and bring the water department and the streets and sand and the gas company, and they're going to explain what's happening, and I'm going to fight to make sure that these things are staged so that these businesses are not hurt, that they don't lose all their parking. I talked to the owner of Zwix over on Foster who says that he still has people coming into his store because they had yellow orange signs, no, no parking signs, up for a year and a half. They still think they can't park in front of his store on Foster. That's the kind of stuff that shouldn't be happening. That's the kind of back and forth communication that needs to happen between your aldermen and your businesses. I support all the businesses here in the ward, not only the ones that are here, but I'm going to go out and advocate for you. I'm going to find new businesses and I'm going to bring them to the ward because that's what you need to do. I was working, well, I'm out of time, but I worked on the Six Corners uh, uh, redevelop on master plan and one of the things that I understand about is master planning and that's what needs to happen throughout this ward. Thank you. So, Margaret, you'll be first up for this next question. Again, we're still talking about ward services. So there's a number of different communities represented here tonight, and some of these single individual neighborhoods are actually split amongst several wards. Um, there's a corner that I've been to on Longdale and Ainsley that has three different wards, depending on what corner you're standing on. Yes. So what processes will you use with adjoining aldermen to ensure that border issues will not get ignored and would you support committing menu money or other discretionary funds to projects that benefit more than one ward? I think that I work uh, well with my neighboring ald uh, alderman. Uh, that particular uh, location that you're talking about, Patty, I think at uh, Lawndale and Ainsley, I think we've been out there for some outdoor roll calls. And if I'm not mistaken, Alderman Mel and Alderman Cologne uh, joined me there. Um, so we get along just fine, and we are willing to uh, work with one another on any number of projects. And I think it's important, once again, to communicate not just with uh, not just 
worked uh, with the uh, with the businesses and clearly with the residents of the ward, and we do it in a number of ways. I don't see my I don't see the my my colleagues every day like I might see you. Uh, we meet a few times a month uh, where we might see one another if we're sitting on the same committee, but we're constantly in contact uh, with one another on those particular border issues. Um, so I think that's, once again, important for me to make sure that we work together. And of course, I have been in the past committed to actually um, uh, using uh, funding to uh, uh, on those borders, uh, whether it be resurfacing, lighting, schools, whatever the case might be, um, I'm there to uh, work with my neighbors. Um, I have a case actually uh, right on, on Cicero Avenue now where um, Alderman uh, Arena and I have an issue that we're trying to deal with. So um, I'm just saying that uh, it's important for for me uh, to to work with my colleagues uh, to address the issues that uh, come up and we don't want people to feel disenfranchised as a result of uh, living on uh, the borders of our ward. Mm, oh, okay, yeah, you're next, okay. It is very important to work with our neighboring aldermen because, as you say, the, co the community, there are a number, a number of communities such as Oldering Park, West Walker, um, Peterson Park, places like that who are on the borderline, Edgebrook, who are in more than one ward. These are neighborhoods that are already very vibrant, who have needs, like a, they're looking to get a library made down in, in West Walker. These are things that I would be very much willing to work very um, happy to work with neighboring Alderman Cologne, Alderman Mel, Alderman O'Connor, Alderman Rena. It's very, or whoever gets elected this time, I'm not gonna say that any of these should, should or shouldn't be elected, but whoever our uh, neighboring Alderman are, it's very important for our ward to have a good back and forth, not only between the aldermen themselves, but the communities that are on those borders. So Albany Park or West Walker or Edgebrook or whatever it is, you have to look at these neighborhoods as a whole and not as an arbitrary line that runs through them. So if projects can be developed that can benefit both sides of the ward, it, it makes a ton of sense to use whatever TIF money or whatever is there, because some of the TIFs actually do run over more than one ward, to work together, not only with the aldermen, but also with the North River Commission and other bodies like that who have been doing a ton of work on the east part of this ward for years and years. Um, I, I hope I've made it clear that my office will have a wide open door policy, and that includes all the other aldermen around us who are welcome to come in, and, and I will feel uh, also uh, a responsibility to reach out to them and communicate with them. Um, I'm, I, I hope you don't mind if I just take uh, the easy way out here and say, you heard what Mark said, you heard what Robert had to say, and I'd have to say ditto. I mean, it, we, I think we're all in agreement with that. So I'm not gonna take your time for anything more than that. Thank you. Okay, so Robert, you're next up with this, and I think you were chomping at the bit earlier to address this issue, which is uh, economic development. So despite some demographic advantages, much of the 39th Ward has struggled to grow a strong business community. And residents often end up leaving the ward to do their shopping and dining. Um, what are some of the challenges that you perceive to development and then what would be your plan to work with residents, developers, and other partners to attract businesses to the community? And what processes would you then use to involve residents regarding these new developments and any zoning changes? So my process is, <clears throat> again, I come from a community leadership background as president of my community association, being very involved in my community and in the surrounding communities. I am about involving communities, chambers of commerce, local business, other stakeholders in figuring out what is the best way to move forward for our major um, arterial streets, our business streets, which have all been struggling. Thank you for saying that because what you've seen out there is what is happening and is that there's no real development happening happening in the ward. It's been flat for many, many years. You can see a, the wards around us in the 45th ward and the 40th ward. 
47th Ward. There's a lot of development happening in the 41st Ward. It's only in the 39th Ward where very, very little is happening. And the thing is, is that too much money is flowing outside of our ward into Lincolnwood or into Niles, where you can spend your money here if you have the businesses to go to. And I've worked on economic planning. I was part, I was asked by the Alderman to be part of the Six Corners uh, Association Master Plan Project in 2012. We worked on that. It was uh, six corners is Cicero and Irving Park, which is the busiest intersection in the city. 60,000 cars a day. It's very, there's a lot of pedestrian challenges there. There's a lot of uh, old um, um, buildings there that have been hard to fill for years. It was been, everybody wanted to know why couldn't we get anything going in six corners. So they did a master planning process. I was part of that. Now, two years later, they have 20 new businesses opening just in that area, 20 new businesses in that area of Six Corners. I'm telling you that we can do that here in the 39th Ward. There's no reason that all of that can't happen here. If you involve the community to find out what it is, the kind of businesses you want to see, if the alderman goes out and advocates for you, if you have a plan to follow that the community also understands, you're going to have success. And that's what I'm talking about. Would you address economic development? Well, if you look at the map of where I live, I'm uh, about 150 feet from Elston. And if you want an example of the way not to run a ward, Elston's a good example. There are too many empty storefronts on Elston. It needs tender, loving care. It needs an old who walks up and down the street, knocks on doors, talks to people, find out what their needs are, and then tries to locate businesses that will fill those needs. We need an active, present, old person, and that's the kind of person I am. Just as many of you came in tonight and you said, oh, Joe, yeah, you knocked on my door last summer. I'm not going to change. I'm going to be still out there walking the precinct, knocking on doors, because I need to hear from you, because I'm your representative, and I want to help create the kind of word that you want. And that's my pledge to do that. Um, I would uh, just like to say that when it comes to economic development, I certainly make that a, a priority. Um, and the uh, suggestion that there is no economic development going on here in the 39th Ward seems uh, rather odd. Um, so let me say that I work with all the stakeholders, to, uh, including the communities, the community associations, the residents, the local chambers of commerce. I have some wonderful local chambers of commerce, the Korean Chamber. I have Peterson-Pulaski Business Industrial Corridor. I have um, the Sauganash Chamber, the Edgebrook Chamber. I meet with the executives of uh, these particular chambers monthly to find out what's happening in their community, to find out if the existing businesses are doing okay, if they need to expand, and what we can do to help them make that happen. Um, I think it's very important that I play the role of uh, not being an obstacle in the red tape that oftentimes can be government. Um, I'm here to make sure that um, they get what they need, whether it be service with the local police department or assistance from business affairs, I'm there for them. And once again, to suggest that there is no uh, development going on, um, let me just throw out a few items. We're opening up a restaurant depot. This is, uh, I call this the Costco for restaurants. If you need uh, any supplies, you'll have to go to restaurant depot. Only restaurants are allowed to actually shop there, but it's over a $17 million uh, project. Uh, we have Sauganash Glen. We're building new homes, 35 single family family homes, 7-Eleven right on the corner here, the Albany Park Library, and Beltone, CCH, and Tie Town, which hasn't gotten a dime of TIF dollars. So I think my time's up. Okay, Joe, you're going to be first step for this next round of questions, which deals more with nature and the environment. So uh, we're sitting here with the 19 inches of snow out there, but I, I think we've had 19 inches of rain before. So in parts of Albany Park, North Park, and North Mayfair, especially near the Chicago River, have experienced two devastating floods in the past six years. And the uh, Albany Park Tunnel Project has yet to start construction. 
So how would you lobby for holistic solutions and adequate funding for storm water management issues? Wow, let's see. First of all, I'm the kind of person who goes out and asks lots of questions. So I'm going to take, I would take that question, dissect it, and I would begin looking at our environmentally aware groups and ask for their support, for their information. I would talk to the state and the city about what their plans are for water in, in the ward and in the city. Um, I, would be, uh, I would make sure we actively involved with the River Commission. Um, and all those, all those kinds of things. I, I don't, I'm not going to sit up here and say I know everything about water, um, but when it comes to ecology, I would tell you that I recycle, I compost, I garden, um, I walk and bicycle, uh, I use public transportation, and I'm rather eco ecolo ecologically minded about preserving a good planet for my grandchildren. Thank you for bringing up this issue. It's a very important one for the, uh, especially for the Albany Park community that was so devastated by the flooding of the North Branch of the Chicago River, I believe in 2008, and then again in 2013. Uh, this is a project that we, along with uh, the neighbors who at times had to be brought out of their homes in boats because things had gotten so bad uh, during the uh, severe Severe flooding uh, that we experienced in those two years. It was absolutely horrendous um, and something serious needed to be done. We had tried uh, we're developing wetlands in Eugene Field. Uh, that might help a little, but it really wasn't going to do the trick. So we have put together, along with the uh, City of Chicago, the Department of Transportation, the State of Illinois, the Water Reclamation District, uh, we have a $50 million uh, diversion tunnel that will be built, and I want to mention it's not going to be built on actually we're not going to rip up Foster Avenue it's going to be just adjacent to it in in the parkland and I feel that this is the only way that we can address the severe flooding that our residents um, have experienced um, over the last several years uh, once again these things do uh, take time and effort and money uh, but I'm convinced that we're proceeding with it currently Study. It is an engineering right now, and construction should start this year. Okay, thank you. Robert, regarding uh, water management. So, <clears throat> for too long, residents have been asking for relief and feel like they're getting nothing. Um, money is being spent with no purpose or apparent result. Um, I don't, nobody seems to have heard or knows what the plan is for the next time we have one of these millennial floods that seem to occur every five to ten years now. Um, there is a plan now to spend this $50 million to do this uh, um, water diversion project, but what is the plan in between before this actually gets comes online? How are residents going to have their homes protected? The residents I've spoken to in Albany Park, right by the river, nobody knows what's going on. They said the last time there was a flood, they couldn't get any real service from the ward. They feel being left out there. People have lost their homes to these floods. It isn't just they're getting their basements flooded. Homes have been taken away. This is a serious thing that has not gotten a serious hearing in the ward, and it's something that needs to change. You need to not only just talk to the Water Reclamation District and Congressman Quigley and other congressmen, but you have to bring those people to that community to let them know what it's going. Some of you might have heard just now tonight for the first time what's actually going on with this project. That's because there's no communication between the ward and the communities, between the wards and neighborhoods. That is what I'm going to change. It's time for you to know what's going on, how your money's being spent, for you to understand what to expect and when that's going to come. There's no excuse to be keeping people in the dark for this long and saying that we're working on it, trust us, it's not, you know, we'll get to it eventually. Meanwhile, people's homes are being taken away. This is unacceptable. You need somebody to fight for you. You need to know how your money's being spent. It's not being well spent now. I will change that. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so for our next question, North Park Village Nature Center is one of the jewels, definitely, 
of this ward. It's currently protected by a 75-year easement agreement that went into effect in 1989. Do you support plans to maintain this hidden gem in perpetuity as opposed to its present 75-year agreement? Margaret. Um, I think I'd be open to conversation on that. I, I don't know what the, uh, the details of it would be, but I'd be open to conversation and discussion to look into that. Uh, a quick follow-up in the nature category. Uh, do you have a sense for what you think should be done about the deer that uh, apparently are overrunning Peterson Park? Problem. That really is a problem. Um, let me uh, just share with you, it's not just the deer that are overrunning uh, uh, Peterson Park. You know, they're... they're 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 on the northwest side, all right. We're we're dealing with them at the uh, you know at the Felician Convent, uh, in the cemeteries. It's my understanding that actually when uh, you know we close the gates at uh, Peterson Park at night, I don't know they go out and they end up waiting on Central Park to get in in the next morning, all right. So. Uh, you know, I, there's no way in the world, I'm, I wouldn't support culling the deer, absolutely not. Uh, we just have to teach people to learn to live with the deer. They need not to feed the deer. Um, and uh, we will work with uh, certainly animal control in order to uh, uh, try to alleviate uh, the deer problem. Thank you. So Robert, uh would you care to address uh, the North Park Village Nature Center and uh, also the deer in Peterson Park? So North Park was formed because a bunch of communities and neighbors got together to save it from being turned into basically a strip mall. This was about 30 so years ago. This was a great thing that they did. They saved that. This is a nature center actually that is known throughout the whole city that people come here to this part of town. I would definitely support making that a permanent thing in perpetuity. There's no reason to remove that as an asset to our community, to the children and the schools that use it. It's a great green space. And also North Park is a home to many elderly who live there who have had a lot of their, have had their security removed and have been reaching out to the ward and have been getting no response. This is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about over and over because I keep hearing about it over and over. These are the things that we need to address as a community. They need to have the proper security in there. Um, also, you know, as far as the deer go in, in Forest Glen, we not only see a ton of deer, we also have seen coyotes and every other little critter that you can imagine running through my backyard. That it is kind of, I would agree with the alderman, that it is a fact of life up here, and it's not really the best idea to go around culling the deer, but there have to be ways of looking at trying to reduce the population. I think that one of the big issues with North Park is, is that it's, I've heard it could s sustain for the size of it, about two deer, but actually there's a whole herd of them there. And that is a real issue for, you know, other things going on with the green space. So it is an, it is an, an issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Joe? Um, there, there are scientific ways to uh, take care of deer populations without culling them, and I think we should uh, we should bring in some specialists who uh, can uh, basically they, they shoot the females and make them infertile, and the males don't mind that that they're, that they're infertile, and, and and but 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 there are fewer deers in the long run. And I think that's that's an ecologically acceptable way of doing it. Am I on deer? Uh, okay, well. <laughs> Well, I, I, I have to be informed on something, right? <laughs> well, there. But I used to live in the forest, and I used to live way out in the country, so I'm, I'm well aware of deer, believe me. OK. And did you have a comment on North Park Village Nature Center? Um, I think it's a great place. Um, I've been there a couple times. And, and I think one, the other comment I would have on that is that I, I think we should look around for more ways to have more places like that, pocket parks and such like that throughout the ward so that you don't have to just walk down the street. I mean, I have a park close to me. It's not in the ward, but it's, I'm on the edge, so it's the next ward. And I think that, that, that where we can find places to put in more parks, I'm, I'm really well in favor of that and would promote that. Thank you. So now we're moving on to education. Um, Robert, you'll be first up on this one. So according to the CPS facilities master plan, schools on the Northwest side are experiencing an overutilization crisis. Most, if not all CPS schools serving the 39th ward are either at capacity or overcrowded, some as high as 146%, such as Taft High School. 
As aldermen, what would you do to address this overutilization crisis, and how would you engage with CPS to advocate for all schools in the 39th Ward? So as your alderman, I would advocate for all the schools, not only in the ward, but the schools that are that ward residents go to that are, happen to be fall just outside the ward. All of those schools are important to people in the ward, such as Bobian and Farnsworth and Onahan and um, uh, there's an, I can't remember the other one on the east part, but all the high schools, neighborhood high schools here are also outside of the ward, but one of the things that I've been advocating is that because of the overcrowding at Taft and other local high schools is that we need a new local high school here on the northwest side. We need a new elementary school here because our, all of our schools are overcrowded. We need our schools to get real attention. You know, there are schools that have gotten additions in the ward, but then there are other schools that have gotten nothing. Schools like Volta, schools like Palmer, schools like Belding are all crying out and needing things. Bel uh, Palmer needs an addition. It has had temporary buildings out there for 15 years nearly. There's no excuse, no reason for that. I know that you know, a recent piece that the alderman put out claiming to have gotten an addition for uh, Peterson School when it was in fact done while it was in the 40th Ward under Alderman O'Connor, you know, the principal at the time had actually come to the alderman to ask for help and TIF money to get that addition done at Peterson, and he was told no. Then when it got mapped into the 40th ward, he went and asked the same question, and two years later he had the addition. So what's going on with Palmer School? As your alderman, I'm going to get an addition there, because when I go to that school and I see what the principal has done there, and I've talked to the principal, it's amazing stuff. He's brought down discipline and absenteeism by 20%, which is awesome. The parents are involved there, but when you see the school from the outside, it looks like hell. And that needs to change. It, the parents and the students deserve to have the best facilities possible. We need to up our game with education in the city, with security in the city. We need to change the priorities so that these are the main things that we're going to do. Uh, just a quick follow-up, when you mentioned that you would support bringing new schools to the ward, would you advocate for those being neighborhood schools with neighborhood attendance boundaries as opposed to magnet or selective enrollment? Yes, neighborhood schools. Thank you. Joe, you're next up on education. Um, I, I'd like to remind you that uh, my background is education and that I most recently served on the local school council of Roosevelt High School. So uh, education is near and dear to my heart and my soul and my mind and my livelihood. Um, and so I first would say that I would deal with this problem because I advocate an elected school board. We need to, we need to have a, citizens have a voice in who runs their schools, a better voice than going through the mayor. Um, I'm sorry, I just had a senior moment, and I, I thought, well, so. Uh, for utilization oh, oh, yeah, and, and, and we certainly do need more, another school or two, a high school and probably an elementary school in the ward, and it should be neighborhood schools. I'm totally in favor of neighborhood schools. I think they're important for the community. I think they're important for the children. I think they're important for good educations. Um, one of the issues that I addressed um, uh, some time ago was uh, the uh, absolute overcrowding of the schools in the Albany Park community. Um, I worked very hard to bring a uh, additional uh, middle school to uh, Hagen and uh, was very successful there. In addition, we worked to bring a um, a new uh, facility for the Albany Park Multicultural Academy. It was current, it had been housed in Von Steuben. So by being able to build a new school, we actually were able to expand uh, the space available to Von Steuben High School while giving the Albany Park Multicultural Academy Upper Grade Center its own facility. Um, so I'm very proud of the work that we did there. During that time, we also um, did bring in uh, additions to um, uh, uh, Volta. We recently, very recently, have been successful in getting additions to um, to. Uh, 
Saugenash School. Uh, Alderman, Alderman O'Connor and I worked together to bring an addition to Peterson School because, as we s talked about earlier, you know, TIF boundaries, you know, they, they don't go according to, um, they don't go according to ward boundaries. So we actually uh, worked to bring that addition to Peterson School together because people in the 39th Ward and people in the 40th Ward um, both um, uh, uh, attend that particular school. Um, Palmer, I was just there today. I think that Mr. Ray was going to join us tonight. He's a wonderful pr principal. Um, I was just uh, in his uh, class today for his DARE graduation, and uh, I want to commend uh, all the fine work he's doing, and we're going to work together. Thank you. So we've dealt with uh, education at the elementary and high school level. Now we're going to move on to Northeastern Illinois University. Their Decade of Dreams or Facilities Master Plan um, has identified a number of capital requests, one of them being the building of college dorms with street level retail in place of currently <laughs> occupied storefronts and homes on Bryn Mawr adjacent to Foster Avenue as well as, the, as, as some dorms on Foster Avenue. Uh, do you support the use of eminent domain for the development of college dorms? And would you work with NEIU, the property owners, and businesses to advocate that the first phase of dorms be built on existing NEIU land? Joe, you're first with this hot potato. Um, I have already addressed this hot potato. I spoke to the Board of Trustees of NEIU last time they met and I'm on the docket for tomorrow night at the meeting to say the same thing I'm going to tell you. I am opposed to the use of eminent domain for taking property to give to private enterprise, period. Eminent domain is meant to build things that all the public share, like roads and parks, not uh, an office building and an apartment house that a private owner is going to have. Um, I would certainly tell NEIU they have lots of vacant land right now they can build dormitories on and they should build them there. That no way will I help them or encourage them to tear down existing pro properties, businesses, family homes that have been there for 50, 60 years. Um, I'm opposed to that and I'm uh, on record as being so. Thank you. Um, I am also opposed to the use of eminent domain here. And uh, let me just share with you that um, I've been through this experience um, uh, building public buildings a number of times. The room that you're sitting in right here uh, was uh, private property. Um, however, the city of Chicago did not, did not need to uh, use eminent domain. They worked with each and every one of these property owners to make sure that they conveyed to them uh, the ability to give them a fair price uh, for the sale of their property. So this was one example, and once again, we uh, were able to purchase a, a number of properties here on Pulaski, uh, and if you look on the other side of the street, the uh, parking lot that services this building, we were able to pick up quite a bit of land. None of it needed to go through the eminent domain process. They were able to work with the property owners. Second time that I'd, I've um, made sure that we did not need to uh, go through the eminent domain process in the city of Chicago was with the Albany Park Library. If you remember, the adjacent property was a 20-flat apartment building, worked closely with the owner to make sure that they got the appropriate price and wasn't it wasn't necessary to go down that, that road road. Um, so I, it's hard for me to believe that the university couldn't uh, actually work with the six property owners on Bryn Mawr uh, in order to give them the price that they need to, to, to move forward on this project. Um, so I... I've encouraged the university, and they, they have put together their community com connection. I think they're reaching out better to the neighbors than they had in the past, and I'm going to work with him, them to make sure that anything that comes forward is uh, work, they work closely with my office on any zoning or plan development issues. Thank you. Robert? 
So a police station like this one, or a library even, <clears throat> it's not really the same thing as what Northeastern is talking about, because this is something that was built for the city. It's also a process done through the city. Northeastern is talking about taking properties and giving it to a private developer who will then make a profit off of somebody else's property. This is the twisted way that the eminent domain has gone forward in this country, and it's very unfortunate. It's something that I definitely do not support. Um, and not a, the worst part of the eminent domain in this situation is, is that the developer will be guaranteed that a certain number of these dorm rooms will be occupied, and if they're not, the state will make up the difference. And that means you will make up the difference to ensure that this developer has a profit. There's two things about this that really I find very disheartening, and one is about the whole eminent domain being used, eminent domain being used in this way, and the other part is that the process is completely broken. I really think that Northeastern University is a great community asset. It's something, it's an uh, institution that I support and that I believe needs support, and if they need to expand in order to be healthy, we need to find out, figure out a way to help them do that. But the fact of the matter is, the alderman who was very involved on their board for years and then got the person who's now the current head of their board appointed to that position, who knew about these plans for many years beforehand, that they were thinking about it, never informed the community of what was coming, what was happening, or what the result of this might be. The only way that Northeastern would ever consider taking these properties is knowing that they might end up doing eminent domain. It wasn't something that they would necessarily go around and you haven't heard anything from the aldermen about actually coming out publicly and saying that they need to withdraw their suit. Nothing. So saying that she's hoping that they're going to work with community better is not good enough. We need an alderman that's actually going to make sure the community is involved from the front end, and then when the university goes and does something like this anyway, then you can say that they're not going to get the zoning or the special use that's required to make this happen. This is the power that the alderman has. So we have um, an additional question that came in from the audience tonight. Uh, we have mentioned a couple of times Albany Park's brand spanking new beautiful library. The question is that um, neighborhoods like Mayfair and Independence Park, they have their libraries still in storefronts. So how would you balance the need for modern facilities and libraries to have longer hours? And what can your office do to advocate for improved facilities? for those communities. Joe, I'm gonna start back with you. Well, I think when you talk about the Independence Park Library, you're talking about my neighbor down the street, and I would say, you know, that's in someone else's ward, but we need to partner, as, we, as I said before, with other aldermen neighbor, in the neighborhood so that we do have better libraries where they're needed. Um, and I think that in investing in the libraries, investing in our children's future and our adults' future, and I'm all in favor, of, and, and that's a high priority for me as an educator. Um, I guess that answers that question, doesn't it? Thank you, Margaret. Um, can I say, I'd just like to mention, because somebody's here tonight that really has been um, at the forefront of the independence uh, library, uh, uh, advocate and Roberta Bowles is, is sitting right here and she has just been you know fighting for years and years to, to make this happen and I, I think that we should acknowledge that um, and I'm, I'm very supportive of her and of Alderman Cologne's uh, move here I've met with them on these issues I've met with the members of the Independence Park Library Board to uh, help uh, in any way I can to move this forward um, and I think that uh, Independence Independence clearly uh, deserves to have their own branch. That is, uh, area is also in a tiff. Could be a challenge, but you, you know the first step, the first step of the journey, right? Um, secondly, I wanted to uh, say that um, our Mayfair branch is actually right next door to my office, so uh, it's it's happening over there. And uh, I'll tell you that teacher in the library program is fabulous. That's a in scene for all the you know ten year olds in the neighborhood. Um, but we're always looking to um, develop more relationships with the. Uh, 
friends of the library, with the, uh, the surrounding community, and I think that I have uh, been helpful uh, trying to connect the local principals uh, to the librarians to make sure that we have a robust uh, library card program and that the children in the surrounding schools, for example, whether it be by my li by the Mayfair Library, whether it be St. Edwards or Palmer School, uh, they need to know that they have services that can uh, be of use to them. Um, so uh, once again, big advocate of libraries here. Uh, they serve not only uh, to, to check out our books, their digital centers and their community centers. So I'm very much against the cutting back of hours for libraries. I think libraries are very important for our community, for schools, as the Alderman's saying, but also for the community in general. It's very important that these hours remain intact and that city service is not cut back on you. I know that uh, down in Independence Park, they've been trying to work with the Alderman there and apparently Margaret Lorino as well to get a new library. I think that is a very important thing that needs to happen. Um, there was a time when the city was actually replacing libraries throughout the city. Unfortunately, you know, the budget is currently in such a mess that that becomes very much more difficult to do, but it is something I think that should be a priority because like schools, libraries are community hubs, and that is something, you know, when you have a beautiful library, like the Albany Park Library, it is, you know, kind of a, it, people come to it and they enjoy being there. So we have to find a way to make this happen. I think partnering with uh, your, with uh, Alderman Cologne is something that I would do as your alderman because, again, it's one of those things that it affects both sides of the wall, uh, the, the border, as it will, as it were, um, and that we need to advocate for those things. I think the Mayfair Library is another one that also needs to look at, have some serious look at, you know, how we can improve that. Thank you. So our final question for the night before we get to the very exciting lightning round uh, has to do with uh, a big picture issue that impacts pretty much everybody in this room, air traffic. Since October 2013, O'Hare has been using a predominant east-west flow. The result is hundreds of flights daily over the same neighborhoods within a four mile width. The quality of life for the hundreds of thousands of residents under these flight paths has been drastically affected. Property values are declining and noise complaints are up more than 800%. So what actions would you as aldermen take to mitigate noise, advocate for the equitable distribution of air traffic, and work with congressional leaders to revise FAA guidelines on adequate sound levels, increase eligibility for sound insulation, and perhaps a meeting with the mayor? Margaret. Thank you very much, Patty. Okay, uh, let me just say that uh, if anybody's hearing the noise from um, uh, the uh, redesign of the uh, O'Hare runways, it's me. All right, uh, I am, I believe, directly under 27L. So um, I just want to say I can really understand the concerns um, of the community when we when we talk about this particular issue. And I want to say that I was probably one of the first aldermen to sign on to the fair agenda, which basically talks about a fair distribution of flights. I think most of us know that uh, you know there there there. They're not going to shut down O'Hare. And what I like to say when I go to my committee meetings and bring this up with uh, the, the, the former commissioner of aviation is that we did not move next to O'Hare. O'Hare moved next to us. We're a 40 or a $50 cab ride away from the airport. Um, so I'm telling you that I am working with Congressman Quigley, um, and, and he has become a real advocate for us at the federal level pushing the FAA to uh, revisit the new runways and the impact on our communities. Uh, those parallel runways are a problem. I do not want them to shut down the diagonal runways, and I am going to work uh, to make that happen. Um, I think that uh, when we uh, start talking about a new commissioner at the Department of Aviation, I want one that's going to uh, clearly communicate with us better uh, in, in, in a fashion that allows us to know uh, what's happening 
happening uh, at, the, uh, at, at the runway level and what they can do to help us. I want to talk about us working with the airlines, United and American, to make sure that we expedite the, um, uh, the removal of their oldest planes. I'm at a loss. I don't know. So first of all, you cannot soundproof your backyard. <clears throat> so the biggest solution here is an equitable distribution of traffic. The, the way that the FAA and the CDA has set up the, the noise contours around O'Hare is something that they predicted would happen, but not based on actual um, facts. And so it's also based on an outdated level of uh, for the sound of the airplanes. This is something that we, you know, as part of FAIR, we worked re really hard to get Congressman Quigley to start to address this. And he actually has signed a letter with 46 other congressmen uh, to the FAA telling them to change this sound metrics. This is something that you have helped make happen because FAIR started from you with community leaders from your associations. I know that I saw Judy Simpson here and there's other people in the audience who are, have been part of this effort. This started in March of 2013 a full 10 months or eight months before the change was happened and we went to our elected officials including the alderman to say this is going to be a big deal we need to fix this the alderman signed on to the letter of support and when she did that I asked her to help us get a meeting with the mayor because the city owns the airport the city runs the airport the city has created this mess this super highway over your heads that is a complete failure and she said you can get a meeting with the mayor and I said well the mayor doesn't know me he's not going to call me back you're my alderman and you're the president pro tem, the mayor knows you. But she said no. And so the mayor is the person that needs to come to the table, but the alderman is not making that happen, is not helping. Also, as your alderman, I'm going to work with state representatives because there's a law down in Springfield saying there can only be eight runways. So when they open the next runway this fall on Berteau, they're going to try to get rid of some of those diagonal runways. There's things that are, need to happen now that you need somebody who not only knows that this stuff is coming, but is going to advocate to make sure you get the relief you deserve. Well, once again, Robert sold all my thunder. Um, <laughs> but I hear the airplanes going off over my bedroom every night. And since my bedroom is also my office, they go over my desk every day. I hear them all the time. I would first go to the owner of the airport and tell him to stop the you know what. And who's the owner? The city of Chicago. Let's get f honest here, folks. We control the airport. Why are we allowing it to happen? Something's not right in City Hall. And I think that what's not right in City Hall is the mayor and the alderman who rubber stamp everything he wants. And I think it's time that we had alderman who stood up and said, this has got to stop. Shut up that noise. And I agree with that we need to go back to the good old fashioned way where the noise went all the way around and you only heard it once in a while because they were going this way and that way and using diagonal, the diagonal runways. And that's my position and I'll stick to it. Thank you very much and please vote for me. So send the planes back to Arlington Heights. Only part of the time though. Only yeah. part of the time. Okay, now we've come to magic lightning round. Uh, these are just not necessarily even silly questions, but just something fun. Show your personality a little bit. They'll be painless, I promise. Uh, we're going to go uh, Robert, Joe, and then Margaret. So uh, if you could spend the afternoon with one Chicagoan, past, present, real, or fictional, who would it be? That's terrible. All right. That is, like, so easy in the ways. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> Joe, you're next. <laughs> the lady who owned the cow that burned down the city. Oh. <laughs> this is also very okay. uh, I think I'd like to come back and listen to Richard J. Daly, okay? I think that might be an interesting conversation to have. Uh, okay, so next. What is your favorite garden, park, path, or open space in the 39th Ward, and then also in the rest of Chicago? Joe, you're first up for that. 
Well, since you said open space, I, uh, I like Independence Park a great deal. Okay. It's only a couple blocks away, but I really like my backyard the best. And it's, you're all welcome to join me there. 4205 North Avers Avenue. I have a beautiful koi pond and lots of nice flowers. Stop in any time. So, Margaret, your favorite place? Of course, North Park Village. I uh, love that place, uh, and I love the, uh, the the stone garden. What about citywide? Uh, citywide, uh, let's say, uh, I'm going to say Grand Park. Okay, thanks. Robert? In the 39th Ward, it's really hard to choose. Um, definitely North Park Nature Center, um, the Forest Glen Woods, which were very near my house, um, and just the Forest Glen Gardens that uh, my community has worked so hard on right by the Metro Stop. I'm very proud or, of my community and, and the beautification that we've done. Um, and in the city at large, I would say Lincoln Park, the Lincoln Park Zoo, okay. and the Nature Center. So, Margaret, up to you. Uh, when you were 10, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a teacher. Really? At what, what grade level? Um, I think that I wanted to uh, teach high school. I was looking forward to getting there myself. <laughs> uh, Robert, what did you want to be when you were 10? Um, I guess the closest thing would be an architect. I know that I was doing a lot of drawings at that time. I wasn't necessarily specifically thinking about being an architect, but I love to make drawings and build cities from just drawing them. Cool. Joe, when you were 10, what did you want to be? I wanted to be a veterinarian. That's what I had. I was raising rabbits, and I wanted to be a veterinarian. That's why you know so much about deer reproduction, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Name three Chicago experiences, either places, restaurants, foods, that you would recommend to somebody visiting Chicago for the first time. And uh, no deep dish pizza allowed. Robert, you're first. Wow, this is a hard one. Um, the first one would be to go to Heaven on Seven because it's a really unique thing down in the loop. A lot of people can't find it without actually being taken there, and people have blow there. You can basically blow your friend's mind if you take them there. Um, Marge's Candies would be another one. Um, oh, what else? I'm trying to think. I don't know. I guess, you know, just in this ward, I think we have a great, a bunch of great restaurants, but one of them I would say that I've been enjoying a lot lately is the Bryn Mawr Breakfast Club. Joe, three places or experiences? Well, um, the Art Museum, the Field Museum, and the Lakeshore. Margaret? I'm going to stick with the fine restaurants in the 39th Ward. Trey Kroner, love that, all right? Marie's Pizza on Lawrence Avenue. you got to go there during the holidays and see their decorations. And one of my favorites, Superdog. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this, this one, it, you know, it all hinges on how you answer this question. Print? internet, radio, or TV, what's your preferred way to receive the news? Joe. Um, I, I, I look at the Yahoo Di Digest on my iPhone. <laughs> uh, but I do read the Chicago Tribune daily. Um, I think it's important to know what's happening in the city. Margaret? I'm, I'm reading the newspaper on my iPad lately. Especially if you uh, had any issues with the snowstorm, you're not getting it delivered to your front door. How's that? I guess I would say that even the, th uh, the news that we get on the internet, I still consider that sort of print because I'm reading it rather than hearing it or looking at it. So I would say print, including like DNA info. Thank you. <laughs> OK, final question. What will you be doing on Tuesday, February 24th? Margaret? On Tuesday, February 24th, I'm going to be visiting each and every polling place in the city of Chicago, in the 39th Ward and talking to the election judges and the voters, and hopefully um, I'll be convincing them to vote for me. Thank you. Robert? I will also be going to all 45 precincts, uh, bringing snacks for our uh, hardworking judges and engaging with voters. Joe? 
Can you make this interesting? What are you going to be doing? Um, well, I'll do, during the day, I'll be doing what they'll be doing, but at night, we'll probably have a big bash at my house with pizza. That everybody's invited to in your backyard, right? Uh, pizza and beer. I don't think it'll be in the backyard because it's nighttime. We'll be quiet for the neighbors. But yeah, you know, pizza and beer. Come, to, come on, come on. Everybody's going to be voting. All right, so now we've come to the closing statements portion. So each candidate will have two minutes to uh, make the strong case for why you should vote for them on February 24th. Margaret, you're first up. Um, I want to say that I'm proud of all the things that we've accomplished uh, in the years gone by, or new schools, playgrounds, library, police station, developments such as Whole Foods, and the development of the uh, shopping center at Lawrence and Pulaski. But they didn't come just by chance. We work closely with the members of the community and we've worked together in so many ways. There have been collaborations and communication, I think absolutely are the most important part of being an alderman. Uh, for me, listening, acting on requests, and sharing information, that's where it's at. Um, I've done that since the first day in office for my constituents in a whole variety of ways I do this. I think that uh, just as tonight or last month, I attend forums, right? We send uh, word-wide emails out like we did just this past week um, with the, uh, the, the snow updates and the recent storm. We inform people, uh, residents, about Chicago Public Schools, how they would resume uh, after we responding to Chicago Chicago's fifth largest snowfall. Uh, we have our website and our, our, our aldermanic website and our campaign website. Both are in interactive and we can collect your feedback on this. We help inform people about programs that are beneficial. For example, I think I see some people here tonight that we've helped over 400 taxpayers receive over $700,000 in real estate tax refunds. We mail e we mail newsletters, uh, they offer surveys, but we also have outgoing calls for, once again, the snowstorms. We have staff on the street. We have thousands of phone calls and emails that we respond to each and every week. So once again, communication is the most important thing that an alderman can do, and I hope I'm doing it. Thank you. Robert? Let me thank you again for coming out. I really appreciate all of you taking time out of your lives to come hear what we're doing and why we're running and what we want to see for the ward. Um, let me paint you a picture here. Um, healthy, vibrant communities, great schools, safe place to live, great parks, great streets, a real pride of place. This is what you've already done. This is what you've made the 39th Ward because of your pride and your work, you've made the Ward this way. Everything that is great and notable about the Northwest Side is what the Northwest Siders have brought to it. Um, now, add a little color and shade to this picture. Um, sorry. Imagine a Ward where all the work that you do is celebrated, encouraged, uh, backed up by your immediate elected official, that the ideas that you have when, don't go to the ward office to die, but they go to the ward office to thrive. That the I, that um, that you asked, what do you want? That you're asked, what do you want to see for your community? That your voice is heard. That our local business owners who work so hard are promoted regularly by the ward office, so that you know when there's a new business opening, so that you know when there's a restaurant that you can go to that's on a different part of the ward. We have one of the bigger wards in the city, six and a half square miles. This is the ward I see, the commitment rewarded, your request for better service heard, your desire for safer streets made a reality, regular communication for the ward office that tells you just not when there's a weather alert, but when there's a new business opening, when the church fair is happening, when a community parade will take place, what's going on with your city government, what new developments are in the offing, what major infrastructure work will happen in your community, not just days, but a month or more before. This is what you deserve. In the years, the next four years, I see a ward with 100 new businesses. I see a ward where you can spend your money right here. I see a place where accomplishments of our schools, public and private, are celebrated in every corner of the ward. I see a place where your alderman is out there willing to engage. Thanks, sure. I see a ward that'll be the envy of the city. I see a microphone getting past. <laughs> 
story I runneth over. Joe, bring us home. Why should people vote for you? Vote for me because I believe in quality, fully funded public education, access for all to both physical and mental health services, the creation of jobs through public investment and infrastructure improvements, especially as pertains to public schools, parks, and transportation. Other platform issues include an elected school board, give the inspector general the, the subpoena power he needs to do his job, I support the Illinois Fair Map movement, I think we need to reform the TIF program, raise the minimum wage, give fair share income tax, and hire more police officers. And I want to leave you with uh, three words, present, listening, and just. I pledge to you that I will be present. You will see me in your wards, in the neighborhoods, in your parks, in your schools, in your churches, in your meetings. I will listen. I will ask lots of questions and I will listen. And then having listened, I will do my best according to God and my conscience to do what is just for you and our city. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, let's hear it for the candidates for the great job tonight. Um, we'd just like to thank the 17th District for hosting us and the fantastic neighborhood groups who work to sponsor this forum. And you know, give yourself a hand for coming out tonight. It's so cold out.